Hey there, water media painters. Um, I put together this collection of images from both the Mets website and from my own photos of my visit there a couple years ago. And um, some of these touch on a pretty wide variety of things because you all are moving in different directions all the time. But mostly I wanted to put together a collection of images that would um, rather prove to legitimize the use of water media as um, a material because everything is, is generally thought of as oil painting is, you know, the penultimate medium for painting. But uh, that's not necessarily so. And I want you all to feel like you can choose to use water media to create the greatest of great things. So um, hopefully you'll find some of these interesting. I pulled this image knowing very well that a lot of you are really into representation and also the sheer size of this image. It is 96 by 144 inches, which is eight by 12 feet. Um, so, you know, get your stretcher bars ready for that one. What's not clear to me in this is they do describe that there are uh, pieces of text that are laid down in this image, but the, the website doesn't provide a very uh, good opportunity to see that. So you just have to go there yourself. And so will I. Um, but would you think this is an acrylic painting? Probably not. Neither would I. Another uh, very successful current painter, Carrie James Marshall, does very large works and uses uh, water-based media, I think almost exclusively. I got to see a large show of his in Chicago within the last couple of years, and um, it's extremely prolific. And uses the advantage of what water media gives you, which oftentimes is the, the quick drying allows you to move quickly through a painting, different from an oil painting, which allows you to work in a different sort of way. But again, also notice the size, very large piece here as well. And here's an interesting monochromatic painting. The next image is also a, a monochromatic painting. Um, having worked with acrylic paint now, you'll probably have an appreciation for the difficulty in actually achieving smooth transitions and getting things to have a creamy smooth look which is so easy to achieve with oil paint or let's say much easier to achieve with oil paint but this artist has managed to do that it also has a serious 70s vibe with his um, shoes which i appreciate and here's another very large image four by eight feet um, acrylic painting, scene forum, it looks very much like New York City. I suppose it could be any metropolitan city. Uh, it's certainly not what our uh, metropolitan areas look like at the moment, but I think this artist clearly used photography in what he did, uh, the way the edges of the figures are disappearing and they are suspended at a moment, this woman touching her ear and the man uh, at the far left who's walking away and it's almost as if it's, it's a time lapse and he was there for a moment and then he's disappeared. And I can't resist a 3D object that's painted. Um, I had not seen this work before. I thought it was very interesting. Um, water media also is a little more friendly for painting of objects. So uh, don't limit yourself to just painting 2D. This work really begs the question to me of where is the line between sculpture and painting. Yes, it's on the wall. Yes, the image is 2D, but it also has a very powerful object quality, both by its cutout shape and also the sheen of uh, the paint, which you can tell in the blue and the black. I would love to see this uh, in person, but I've, I've only seen this image, but I was very drawn to the shaped canvas, as I know a couple of you are starting to explore with that. So knock yourself out. And if you're not familiar with Klaus Oldenburg, please check his work out. Um, there's always a sense of play and also kind of gross at the same time. And um, it's another great example of using, mm, you could say low art or just general household objects to create great objects. I believe this was covered in latex paint.
So as you can see, uh, due to rights restriction, I can't really show you that image, but you can go to the Met website and look it up on its own. I thought it was such a worthy example of a shaped canvas or board that I, I definitely wanted you to see it. So uh, go and look up Once uh, by Elizabeth Murray if you want to take a tiny look at this painting, because of course you can't even enlarge the picture, but it's a good one. Alex Katz is also very well known for having shaped imagery. This is a freestanding object. You can see the picture on the right shows the quote unquote back view. In this case, you say, what is the back? I mean, I suppose they call the back because the rod is attached on the back. Um, he also has a, a series where they, they're cut out figures that are on the wall. So like the whole wall then becomes the canvas. It becomes part of the frame, the image. And this image in terms of shaped canvas really made me think about the use of art and the purposes of art and what we think of it now versus what is meant through time. Of course, this is a religious image and because of its shape quality, it really starts to get at that object. Um, you could almost say reliquary type of imagery. Um, relics are a tradition in the Catholic Church and not that this is a relic, but just that preciousness of object is very important. And I think this image starts to um, embody that even though it's, it's its own relic by now. But there are some wonderful examples of uh, shaped imagery in Japanese culture. There's a tradition of creating imagery to go on fans and um, Western artists also picked up on this, but I wanted you to see an original one. This is from the 15th century. And then of course it's been presented in a rectangle, but the overall general art shape is a pretty interesting one. And it also refers to the fan itself. And what do you do with a fan? A fan can be used as a tool to cool yourself, to hide yourself, to communicate, all of these things. And um, I can't say that I'm very knowledgeable about Japanese fans, but um, I know that in general, fans are way more than meets the eye. And you may already be aware that um, Edgar Degas was very influenced by uh, Japanese imagery and created several fan-shaped uh, paintings in his career, of which this is one, and it's the Met's own picture. In the next photo, you're gonna see my picture, which you can see why I inserted this one because it really is not quite clear. But there's just something to seeing something in person versus online. And now you can see why I included that photo. Um, but do note how it's been presented. Uh, what do you think about the difference between how it's presented in the first picture where there's no matting and you just see the image versus this? Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I almost prefer it the other way. This screen, this is my own photo of the screen at the Met, and when you get to see the images that are depicted, I think you'll be surprised and hopefully you'll feel as delighted as I was. First, let me tell you that this screen was made in the late 18th century, which if you need to be reminded is late 1700s. So uh, with no further ado, puppies, yes, puppies. Um, when I approached this object and saw that the person had depicted cute little roly-poly puppies playing in what appears to be snow, I just couldn't believe it. I also felt like an immediate um, kinship with this person because of just the simple act of appreciating this and then committing it to an object that would last for hundreds of years um, is pretty wonderful. I don't think this is religious imagery. Um, you could potentially frame it as religious imagery, the, you know, um, the worship of puppies. I don't know, it's not so unworthy. Yes, it's just a, a furball puppy party. Uh, these dogs are having fun. And just consider the person that decided that this is what they wanted to commit to record. The sight of these little animals um, having their joyous time. 
and just one more little puppy. In reading about this on the Mets website, I also discovered that there is a companion piece to this at the Brooklyn Museum, and I had to go uh, pull that up, and it's in the next slide, which you'll see. I also threw in this room, which is a whole room designed by one individual. Um, he hired craftspeople to execute, say, the furniture maybe making and the lamp making. And then the whole room is covered in murals. The reason I included this is because as much as possible, I want you to try to expand beyond a canvas hanging on a wall at least as an exploration uh, to open up your idea of what you can do. Essentially, this is an environment that this person designed and created, and one that was so interesting to me that I had to take a photo of it. Another person through time that you may already be aware of that did this was Frank Lloyd Wright. He designed, of course, the architecture, the furniture, even down to the textile design and the light fixtures. You could think of this as like very controlling reasonable assumption to make, but it's also an interesting experience to have where somebody has orchestrated a whole experience as much as possible. I don't know if you included scents. I suppose that would be another thing you could um, create as a, an experience, but I have to look that up. I must have had something for monochromatic works on this trip because I have quite a few of them. And um, I think what's really also interesting about this is the way that it's framed. It has like a polished chrome frame, um, which reflects all the color that's happening around it. And then the image is just monochromatic and uh, black and white. I don't know what you might think about that. I think it's terribly interesting. And then also think about the fact that the beds are made of metal and I don't think they're this shiny. It's just an interesting concept. Also another piece of what you would call blue chip artwork. Andy Warhol worked in uh, water-based media um, plenty in his career. So again, I put these in here sort of as a uh, legitimizing act to uh, not so that you don't feel like you're not making capital A official full-fledged artwork if you're choosing to use water media because that's just not true. Um, you can use whatever you want. This is a work by Helen Frankenthaler. This is uh, one of the pieces where she painted with the acrylic paint directly on the canvas. There's no priming involved so that you have the factor of soaking in as something that plays into how the image looks. And this looks very clean and um, almost mechanical except for its edges. But when you get up close to it, you actually do see a little bit of subtlety in the paint film. And there's still evidence of the hand in this artwork. All of you have such different interests and pathways that you're following. Um, hopefully these images will, you'll find interest in one of them or two of them, hopefully. And um, keep exploring, keep experimenting. Um, I'm here to offer any technical, emotional, or otherwise advice you might need in this uh, time of distance. So um, happy painting. See you again sometime.